And buonasera a tutti. Thank you for joining me um, on our virtual trip to Florence and Tuscany. Uh, I, I'm going to try to keep this to uh, 30 minutes, which will be a challenge, right? Because, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about, but this is my mission is to just give you a little a little taste, a little aperitivo of, uh, of a, a future trip to Florence and Tuscany. So let's let's start. So uh, just an overview for you of what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll talk about Florence. We'll talk about planning before you travel, recommendations uh, to get yourself ready to go. Um, and uh, most of us have a finite amount of time that we can spend. We need to plan wisely. Uh, then while you're there, what to do, what to eat, what to drink, where to sleep, all of that. And uh, with an emphasis for me, which is always very important, to try to avoid crowds and maximize your experiences. Then we'll move out into the to, into Tuscany. Uh, I had the challenge of trying to pick five. I've got five places, kind of favorites of mine uh, that uh, that I wanted to share with you tonight. Obviously, this is not exhaustive in any way. Again, just a little, little introduction. And then I want to leave time for uh, questions at the end. So let's go ahead and go. All right. So let's I always I love maps. I always like to start with maps. Uh, and uh, this is a map of Italy. Everyone here knows that already. And I just want you probably know exactly where Tuscany is, but here it is in blue in the northern central part of Italy. Many of you, especially those coming from Hawaii, will probably fly into Milan all the way up here in the purple to up really close to the border with Switzerland or down here in Lazio, which is where Rome is. But it's a very easy train ride to get to Tuscany. But there are some other airports that you can consider. Florence has an airport and Pisa has an airport. Uh, Pisa is a terrific airport, very uh, small, kind of like flying into uh, Hilo uh, and a really, really easy connection to get to a train. So think about if you need to make multiple connections, going flying from Hawaii, say, into uh, Germany somewhere or into the UK or Paris. Uh, if you're making that final connection into Italy, you don't have to look for Florence. You can look for Pisa as well. It's a great airport. Um, something to think about, some things to think about early on in your planning. Your book, Getting a good travel book is essential. I'm starting with that, even though it's the last thing on that on the list. But this is something to help you early on in your planning. Now, I have two books up here. One is the Blue Guide to Tuscany. I like that because I'm a nerd, and uh, the Blue Guide is a fantastic book, and it's going to have all the little tiny churches everywhere that you pass by. It's going to probably have some little detail information about it. Whereas the Rick Steves book, I cannot recommend this highly enough. A lot of you know that I have worked for Rick Steves for about 15 years. I've even done some guidebook research for them. Uh, I make no royalties off of this promotion. Um, it's just purely the number one recommendation I can give you is uh, these books are fantastic. Um, they they're, have been updated since COVID. So they're current since uh, since uh, all of the, the COVID shutdowns. So I would highly, highly recommend buying that book uh, before you do any travel planning. If you're traveling in Italy elsewhere, uh, think about the Rick Steves Italy book. Now, when to go, that's gonna be a big consideration for all of us. Um, for those of you who don't have to travel in the summer, uh, shoulder season is a really good idea. And I've put the high season uh, on here and high season for it, it travel in Italy is from Easter until November 1st. November 1st is All Saints Day. So um, Easter's coming early this year, or it's in early April. So they're going to have a very long tourist season. Um, we have to think that it's not just the Americans that are traveling, the Europeans are traveling as well. And they tend to have holiday after holiday after holiday. 
Uh, and so you'll get waves of Germans, waves of French, uh, waves of British coming through Italy, and that starts really kicks off in Easter. So if you really want to travel at low season, which I highly recommend to avoid the um, the crowds and the and the heat, I would think about traveling before Easter, so March or April or even late into October and November. Now thinking about accommodations, um, what I would really recommend you think about in terms of in, in Italy, unlike in Hawaii where we have kind of a contentious relationship with Airbnb, Airbnb is a phenomenal way to go over in Italy. You get a lot for your money. Of course, you have to be careful and really read the reviews and all of that, but think about Airbnb and also about hotel accommodations. Uh, I'll get into some other ideas about accommodations for Tuscany once we once we move out of Florence. Now, once you get into fly into Italy, this is a slide I used in my last talk, you, you very well will have a train in your future. Trains uh, are really easy to use once you get the hang of them. Uh, again, in the Rick Steves book, it's gonna explain exactly step-by-step uh, how to buy train train tickets and, and the benefits of train travel. Florence is a terrific hub to move out to smaller towns. You can even get to on the lower, the, the lower image there is the Cinque Terre. You can even get out to the Cinque Terre for a day from Florence. So Florence is really well uh, uh, centrally located and uh, has great travel connections to other cities. So you can do lots of day trips from Florence. Um, but if you, uh, for those of you who are thinking about being outside of cities or going to some of the smaller towns that I'll talk about, really think about renting a car. You absolutely do not need a car in Florence. I would highly recommend against ever having one in Florence. Parking is really difficult. The traffic is crazy. The Vespas uh, will weave in and out, and they're they're pretty terrifying for most of us. So I would not have a car in Florence, but a car out in Tuscany is can be just a joy. So think about that. The pros of renting a car, you have lots of flexibility. If you're, you're in a group of four or, or you could get a van, you could um, travel together. Um, it can, can save you time and even be quite economical. All you need is your US driver's license and a credit card. The cons, you don't want to take them into any of these historic uh, city centers. You don't want to have them in Florence. Train travel is very relaxing. But if you're trying, as I said, to, to move around these small towns, um, it, it can be kind of difficult and, and you can end up uh, losing a lot of time depending on where you're going. So it just really depends what you want to do. Uh, the mode of travel uh, will be different. Or buying train tickets. So you can very easily buy train tickets on trainitalia.com. Um, I've got a website right here. Uh, there's an English, uh, you can buy them uh, with an English search engine, no problem at all buying them at trainitalia.com. A lot of you though may end up buying train tickets using the self-service machines. Um, they're very easy to use. A couple of caveats though. Number one, uh, if you try to use a credit card, uh, you may not uh, be able to, it's very likely that you won't be able to use your US credit card because you need a true chip and pin. Now, for those of us in Hawaii, the uh, the uh, Hawaiian Airlines MasterCard actually has a pin. So you can use that uh, in these vending machines. Um, one thing that I would highly recommend is that you don't accept help. People will come up and, oh, do you need help? And here's how you do this. And they'll either be looking for kind of a tip or potentially they'll be pickpockets. So please be really careful of that. Now, if you uh, sometimes if you're buying a local train ticket, you may have to validate that ticket. If your ticket doesn't have a specific day and time stamped on it already, like on a reserved fast train ticket, um, you may need to validate the ticket and you'll see that uh, there are these kind of machines that are just like a punch card, old, old time card. You just stick it in the slot, stick your ticket in the slot and, and uh, stamp that. All right, so now we're finally headed to Florence and uh, get to see this beautiful city, the beautiful dome 
uh, and I want to talk to you about things to do while you're in Florence, what to see, what to do, what to eat and drink. All right. So I love to start with maps. I mentioned that earlier. And um, I, I love this old map from 1500. For those of you who've been to Florence, uh, you can actually see from this map that most of the, the sites that you'll see today are on this map from 1500, which I think is amazing. I love to time travel when I'm in Europe um, and we can see some, some sites here. This is the this is Santa Maria Novella Church over here. We can see the big Santa Maria del Fiore with the dome. We can see the uh, Palazzo della Signoria here, and even uh, some of the old walls, which still some of them are intact. Right over here on the right hand side, where my cursor is, there's San Miniato al Monte even the Pitti Palace. So it's wonderful that Florence, most of what you're going to see and do in Florence is right here inside these old medieval and Renaissance walls. This is a more modern version uh, of a map. This is the kind that you'd pick up at your hotel. I just really want to point out that Florence is divided by the Arno, as most, most of us probably already know. The Arno River is here. This is the area where most of the big sites are, the, the Duomo and the Baptistry. Over here, we have the Academia, which is where Michelangelo's uh, David is. The Uffizi Gallery here, the Ponte Vecchio, which is beautiful bridge here, the Pitti Palace and Santo Spirito at the bottom. Now, going back there, sorry. Um, on this side of the Arno River, where the Santo Spirito is, that is called the Oltra Arno. And that is really a wonderful neighborhood to stay. Great uh, restaurants, great Airbnb places. To, it's really a neighborhood. You get a real feel of being in a neighborhood. Uh, and for, I can tell you that from here, the center of the Oltra Arno in uh, Santo Spirito, to the Duomo, for example, it's about a 20 minute walk. And a great thing about Florence is it's flat. So um, now you're gonna have steps to climb in these wonderful Renaissance and medieval buildings, but Florence itself is flat and very walkable. This is the train station from the train station, say to the Uffizi. This is about as far as you're gonna walk most of the time. Again, it's about 20 minutes. So this is not a big uh, area that you're covering. Now, a lot of you, unless you've been to Florence uh, half a dozen or more times, uh, you might want to go and see some of the really big sites. Uh, you might want to see the, the David. He's not to be missed at the Academia. And you may want to go see Botticelli, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, other very famous painters of the Renaissance at the Uffizi. But doing so really requires some planning. Now, um, for me, as I mentioned before, it's a priority to try to avoid crowds as much as possible. And so thinking about the time of year that you're going, if you go outside of that peak travel time of um, uh, after, between Easter and November 1st, uh, you, you know, you're going to run into crowds anytime between April and about November. Um, and what we want to do is try to minimize that, and maximize your, your experience. So if you're going during that peak time, uh, some ways that you can, can uh, maximize your time and, and avoid crowds is thinking about the time of day, going early in the day and late in the day. So for example, with the Uffizi, I would recommend going right when they open 830 in the morning and making a reservation in advance. Those people that you see in that line, they are most likely people who did not read that Rick Steves book and make a reservation in advance and they're waiting and they're wasting time for an hour or more uh, to get into the Uffizi. Um, so making a reservation and going early in the morning. Now the David, uh, to see him, you could go early in the morning as well. Uh, or even late in the day. Most people probably only need about an hour or hour and a half in the academia because most people are just there to see David and his uh, prisoners uh, or slaves. So uh, about an hour and a half, you could budget 
for those of you really interested in medieval art, add a little bit more time. And for those of you who are musicians or interested in music, there is a musical instrument collection in with in the academia with David. So think about that. Now, the other area, uh, the other uh, site really that you would want to make a reservation for is Lime Brunelleschi's Dome. Um, that requires a reservation. But other than that, nothing else in Florence really re re requires a reservation with some few small exceptions, okay? Now, another thing you could think about doing is going on a guided tour, either one that's fully organized, like the ones that I offer, or uh, the one uh, maybe hiring a local guide for a day can be really money well spent. Now, um, what I like to do also in Florence, because I have the good fortune of being there a lot of, uh, often, is I like to find some hidden gems. Um, and uh, while some of the some of the sites that I or you know most of the sites I'm gonna gonna tell you about aren't really super hidden, but they're not crowded, and that's something that I really appreciate. Now here you can see one of my tour members from the fall, Althea, and she's uh, at the Brancacci Chapel. Brancacci Chapel is a chapel in that old Charno, so on the other side of the Arno from the from all of the Uffizi and uh, Brunelleschi's dome. This is a chapel that was painted 50 years before the birth of Michelangelo at that dawn of the Renaissance. And they were doing a restoration. And so we had the opportunity to climb up on the scaffolding. Now they're still doing restoration. And if you're going to Florence this year, it would be a good idea to look into whether or not that restoration is still ongoing. And if you can book a ticket to climb up on that scaffolding it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So looking for special exhibits, or special even concerts or those kinds of things can really add to your experience. Do your own research, consider hiring a local guide. They'll, they will be a font of information and you can ask them about these kinds of special, uh, special exhibits and special entrances or considering a tour. Um, now, one of my favorite museums in Florence that is never crowded I don't know why it's not, because it's really a highlight, is the Bargello Museum. This is the interior courtyard of the Bargello Museum, which at one time was a prison, but it is a uh, museum today of the of sculpture of the Renaissance. And you can see uh, a tour group there, but here you can see two of the most famous sculptures in the Bargello or among the most famous sculptures. Uh, one, the one on the left is Donatello's David and the one on the right is Bacchus by Michelangelo. So you can see many sculptures by Michelangelo and Donatello and other Renaissance sculptors. The, the Bargello, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's got, it's really, uh, in terms of sculpture, what Uffizi is for painting of the Renaissance, but again, not likely to be crowded when you're there. Now, another site that I absolutely love, I walk up there every time I'm in Florence, is San Miniato al Monte. San Miniato al Monte uh, was built about 400 years before Brunelleschi's dome. It's a beautiful architectural gem, and it is up on Monte, means mountain, so up on a hillside, um, uh, and in incredible views of Florence. So even if you go up and walk up there uh, and don't catch the museum or the uh, the church open, just turn around at sunset and you'll have this view. Um, now, a lot of you may know about Piazzale Michelangelo, which is a nice kind of a platform, kind of a piazza uh, up near San Miniato al Monte. That's a great place for this view. Uh, but it's often very crowded. San Minia, the steps of San Miniato al Monte, not crowded, even higher, fantastic views. Now, from the center of Florence, it's going to take a good 20 minutes, leisurely 30 minutes, and you're going to be going uphill to get there. Now, I know lots of you like to eat. There's me having some uh, pork with some truffles last fall. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about eating well in Italy and Florence. So in uh, in Italy, uh, they, as many of you may know, they don't eat at six o'clock at night. Uh, they at least they don't eat dinner at six o'clock at night. They might have an aperitivo at six o'clock, but they don't eat dinner until usually about eight o'clock or later. 
Restaurants won't open until about 7 or 7.30. Lunch is usually between 12 and 2.30-ish. Italians tend to eat uh, 8 p.m. for dinner, 1 o'clock, oftentimes for lunch. One of my recommendations for you is try to get into restaurants right when they open. Uh, and you may be able to get a, a, a table without making a reservation. But crowds have come back to Italy and the, the better restaurants are very likely to have to, you'll need to make reservation. So uh, so try to do a little bit of planning. If you're not into planning, what I'd say is wander around, look, look for menus that have a handwritten menu uh, for the day because you know the food is going to be fresh. Try to get a little bit out of the tourist area uh, and uh, look for daily specials. Um, and, uh, and Italians eat course by course, starting with the antipasto, the primo, which is the pasta, the secondo, which is meat or fish, and the dolce is dessert. So they eat in waves. You don't have to order all of that. And you have to ask for the bill. It's rude in Italy for them to bring you the bill. Unless you're sitting at a bar, they often will bring you uh, the conto, the bill. But you would want to uh, ask for the bill because they don't want to rush you. The table is yours as long as you want. Uh, Italians eat seasonally. So they eat whatever is fresh and in season. They eat locally and they eat slowly. So sit down, savor your food and ask what the local specials are. Uh, and you can't go wrong. This is a uh, this is uh, from my trip in the spring to Florence. You can see a, a waitress there. She's wearing a mask. They're not wearing masks in Florence anymore at out, especially at outdoor restaurants like this. You can find these everywhere in Florence. But at a place like this, in a major piazza, sitting outside, you're very likely going to be paying quite a pretty penny for uh, for a coffee or a prosecco or glass of wine. But what I would really recommend is to go over to that old Toronto neighborhood in Florence. This is the uh, Piazza of uh, Santo Spirito. It's in the heart of that old Toronto neighborhood. Lots and lots of cafe, lots of students, lots of life, uh, great food. I'd really recommend going over to the old Toronto. Uh, or think about going to a market. This is something that we did on my tour in the fall. Uh, we went to the Sant'Ambrogio market. A lot of people go to the Mercato Centrale, which is also fantastic. But, but the Sant'Ambrogio market is smaller, more uh, kind of local, not as focused as on tourists as the Mercato Centrale. And we even had a tasting. You could do, you could have lunch there. You could just have some tastings of some different things. You And if you... Um, do stay in an Airbnb. One of my favorite things to do is go shopping at the market. Uh, another thing that's fun that I that uh, maybe those of you who've watched Stanley Tucci uh, have learned about the wine windows. And I had a great time wa uh, wandering around searching for wine windows this last year. Uh, and this is uh, me ordering my my red wine through one of the wine windows. Actually, the one featured in Stanley Tucci's. Uh, TV programs. If you haven't seen that, highly recommend that series on CNN. Um, and then uh, uh, another thing that you can do that's fantastic for, for eating is doing a cooking class. Here, Umberto is offering me pesto, which is not Florentine, it's Genovese, but it was still fantastic. You can do, uh, you can organize a, uh, a cooking class for yourself very easily in Florence. Now let's head out into the countryside to the La Bella Toscana. Um, and we're going to, to talk about, as I mentioned, my favorite places to, uh, to visit really, really quickly, hard to choose, uh, and then where to stay and what to do. So here's, uh, here's Toscana, Tuscany, and it's divided into its provinces. Um, and uh, um, we'll head out uh, also into wine regions. I haven't really talked about wine, but obviously 
wine is a highlight in uh, in Florence as it is, or in Tuscany as it is all over Italy. And you can see some of the major wine regions. Here's Chianti Classico region between Florence and Siena. It takes about 45 minutes to drive from Florence to, to Siena on the uh, Superstrata. So that gives you a sense of scale. Uh, then some of you who are wine connoisseurs, you will know Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Uh, this is Brunello di Montalcino. And down here in the pink, this is the Maremma. Many of you have heard about the Super Tuscans. Many of those Super Tuscans come from this area down here. All right, so here are my here are my favorite uh, places to talk about, and I'm going to do this really quickly. It's very hard. I could do a half an hour or more on each one of these places for sure. And um, something that I'd love for you to think about while we're doing the talk is uh, think about where where you might like to hear about uh, in the future. I'm happy to prepare talks about any place, and if I don't know about it, I know local guides who do. So you just if you could write in your chat uh, what you might like to hear about next, I would would love to know uh, where you'd like to go. So let's start with the Queen of the Hill Town, Siena. And Siena is an absolute medieval jewel. This is the uh, the Campa, Campo, sorry, the Piazza del Campo, and their city hall, which has been their city hall since the Middle Ages, still is their city hall. And the the um, image on the right is that that Campo, that same Piazza that's on the on the left. It's during the very famous bareback horse race, the Palio, which Siena is most famous for the Palio, though there are definitely reasons to go there other than the couple of days of the Palio. The Palio is free. You can be among the 50,000 standing there in the middle of that piazza. You can see that the dirt has been laid down. The horses do not run on the cobblestones. Um, the Palio is run twice a year, July 2nd and August 17th. So um, you can see that the, the horses, uh, the jockeys are barebacked. Uh, and uh, I have already done a talk about the Palio last summer. I'm happy to do another one about Siena uh, in the future if you'd like to know more about it. But they have its wonderful pageantry costumes, very, very lively, uh, incredible to see if you're in the area. Um, my next, um, my hit list there is Luca, and Luca is most known for its walls, which were built to keep the pesky Florentines out in the 1500s. Um, and the the walls are really uh, kind of the central park for uh, the Lucchese. You can see uh, on the right hand side there, there's a picture of me with my bike. Every time I go to Luca, I rent a bike and ride on the walls. The walls are so thick that you can walk. Uh, ride a bike. They could they could ride drive a car on those walls. They're so thick, but they really use them like a central park. So jogging, riding a bike, having a picnic, the life really happens on the wall in Luca. Um, on the uh, inside of those walls, though, there are are many jewels. Uh, one of them on the left is the Piazza dell'Ampiteatro. This is, and uh, you'll have to, to trust me on this, this is a, an oval piazza. The buildings were built uh, on top of the seats of an amphitheater, which is like the Colosseum is an amphitheater, it's oval. And uh, to sit in that, that amphiteatro, at in the evening at a, and having a drink. It's just wonderful. It's the only oval piazza in Italy. It's really spectacular. And then to the right, you can see San Michele in Foro from the 11th century. This is Pisan Romanesque. Very intricate uh, sculpture, very interesting architecture. Many, many churches of this style in Lucca. Now uh, I'm going to take you on the on the road uphill on the road to my next place. This is uh, outside of the town of Volterra. Volterra was an is an Etruscan city. The Etruscans, if you don't know about them, that's how we get our name Tuscany, Etruria. They are the Etruschi. This is where we get the word Toscana or Tuscany. 
So the Etruscans lived between about the 800s and 300s, depending on when the Romans conquered them. So some lasted a little longer than others, but they're very, very famous in Volterra for, uh, for the urns that they sculpted. This is the urn of the spouses, and you can see the date on there, 510 to 530 BC. Now, Contrast this with Rome, the historical founding of Rome uh, is 509 BC. So this gives you a sense that the Etruscans are before the Romans. And I, I, a little known fact, on the, the right-hand side here, you can see these are the Etruscan walls. Um, and this arch here was built by the Etruscans, third, fourth century BC. That is a rounded arch. The Romans did not invent the rounded arch. The Etruscans did. They taught the Romans and the Romans then obviously would take it to incredible, uh, incredible heights. So, um, so they, uh, this is arguably the oldest rounded arch, uh, in the world. Now, uh, um, Volterra is also a medieval city. As you can see on the left, the Palazzo dei Priori looks a lot like the Palazzo della Signoria in, uh, in Florence, but it is a precursor. It was built almost 100 years or roughly 100 years before the Palazzo della Signoria in Florence. And many other Tuscan towns would copy this Palazzo style. In the but it was also a Roman city before it was a medieval city. And you can see the ruins of a Roman theater in Volterra. All of this in a small, very wonderfully pedestrian uh, hill hilltop town with great food and great wine. Now, Pisa. Lots of people look at me and go, what are you talking about, Pisa? All those crowds, it's so touristic. Well, I could go on and on for at least a half an hour talking about the, the fantastic uh, city that Pisa is. I had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time there. My husband's an astronomer. Galileo was an astronomer and taught at their university. And there's still a lot of astronomy going on in Pisa today. So I've had a chance to spend a lot of time in Pisa and really get to know it. So um, what, I, what I want to convey to you is that this very, very famous town over here on the right hand side is not the historically most important site to see in this, this Campo dei Miracoli. You have, for example, this baptistry, which is on the, on the left hand side, the, the largest baptistry in all of Italy and older than this Campanile. It has a, a beautiful altarpiece inside and the acoustics inside of that uh, that baptistry are such that uh, it, the, the architecture, it's almost built like a cone. And so the acoustics in there are wonderful. If you go on the hour and half hour, one of the guards will sing notes inside and it's just lovely. To the left, you have the, uh, there's a um, famous uh, Campo Santo, the Holy Cemetery, where they brought back 50 galleons of, of uh, soil from the Holy Land and put it there. And inside there also, obviously the dirt isn't that interesting to see, but beautiful series of, of medieval frescoes. Highly, highly recommend that you go in and visit uh, the Campo Santo. The, the church itself, this uh, cathedral here, uh, predates this campanile. The tower itself is just a bell tower for the church, and it has beautiful uh, pulpit and also uh, mosaic, a mosaic by a late medieval artist who was the uh, who was the teacher of a very, very famous artist named Giotto. The teacher is Cimabue. Um, but Pisa, beyond the Campo dei Miracoli, if you just walk just a few minutes away, this is what you get. It's a beautiful medieval town, a university town, lots of lively students, um, and great food, and right along the Arno. It's just down the Arno from Florence. And you can, as I mentioned, fly straight into Pisa. So if you go to Pisa, spend a day, go see the Campo dei Miracoli, see the other things. You can even climb the tower if you want to, but then get away from it and go wander around the back streets of Pisa. 
Next up on my hit parade is Chianti, just driving around Chianti, going and see the beautiful vineyards, having some wine tastings, um, and thinking about staying in something called an agriturismo. An agriturismo is agricultural tourism. So you stay on a farm, someplace that uh, maybe is, is growing uh, Sangiovese grapes in, in Chianti, or uh, they're growing olives. They have to be some type of a farm and be producing something on the land, but you'll often be either staying in the main house, like a villa, or in a self-catering, meaning it has its own kitchen, an apartment like this one on the right hand side. So it's a really great way to, to really kind of dig in and get to know the small town, local culture, uh, staying in an agriturismo. Agriturismi are everywhere in Italy. If you want to go somewhere else in Tuscany, just Google, I want to go to Montalcino Agriturismo, and I'm interested in cooking classes, search any which way you want. They're everywhere and, and they can cater to any kind of, of interest that you have. Some things to do other than wine tasting, you can see you can uh, book an actual wine tour or go with a wine guide and uh, do some wonderful wine tastings. They are not nearly as expensive as they are in California, I can tell you that. Um, but you could also do something like going truffle hunting. This is something we did with my group uh, when we were in Tuscany last fall. And that is a lot of fun. You can see we were out there with the dog having a good time and we really did find some truffles. So, uh, so those are just a couple of things that you can do. Obviously, you would need to rent a car if you go out and, and really want to explore these small towns. So um, I've got already, based on some feedback from my first uh, first talk, some interest in a talk about the Dolomites. I'm working with the, the um, board of the Friends of Italy about scheduling those talks. So I want to let you know that we have kind of on deck plans to talk about the Dolomites, uh, a region that a lot of people don't know a lot about. Uh, but is near and dear to my heart, which is Piemonte or the Piedmont, all the way up in the northwestern part of Italy, and also uh, by request talking about Rome. So if you'd like to know about something else, if you'd like to just know about Tuscan wines, Italian wines, food, history, art, we could go so many different ways with these talks. So I'm very interested to hear about what you would like to hear about. And I want to say grazie to all of you for attending. Grazie to the Friends of uh, Italy Society of Hawaii. And if you're interested in knowing more about my tours, um, I do small group tours. And you can go to uh, my, you can email me about them. You can go to our website there, www.guidedby.com. Um, and, or you can go to my Instagram, which has some photos. So I am now going to open it up uh, for any questions that you might have. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you again. Thank you so much for your attention.